First of all, the co-founder and CEO of SegaSec, Elad Shulman. Elad, come on out here. Buddy, good to see you. Next out, the CEO and co-founder of DMARC, Dirk Van Kukuk. Come on out here, Dirk. Hi. I get that right? Good to see you. Absolutely. Yeah, it was good, right. perfect. <laughs> and now the Vice President of Worldwide Business Development with CloudStrike, everybody, Matthew Polly. Matthew. Oh, oh, it's like yeah. a bad game show, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Senior Director of Orchestration and Automation at Rapid7, Jen Andre. Jen. Hey, there you are. Oh, look at that cute necklace. Our Senior Director of Tech Alliances and APIs with Mimecast, Joe Tibbetts. Joe, come on out here. There you go, Joe. And the moderator from our panel, ladies and gentlemen, the CEO of Mimecast. Let's have a nice hand for Peter Bauer. Peter, there you go. Woohoo! Take it away. So a South African, an Israeli, and a Dutchman with three Americans walk into a summit. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Um, <clears throat> folks, you saw the video panel that we did. Now we're going to do a live one. We'll see how this goes. Um, this concept of pervasive email security, one of the things we spoke about besides the three zones is really the importance of that ecosystem and integrating through APIs with other applications that you may have solving problems more broadly within, uh, within your platform. And so I'm thrilled to have these panelists up with us today, uh, four of our, our key partners that we've either got or are building integrations with today. And I'd like to start by just uh, giving each one an opportunity just to introduce themselves. And um, perhaps starting with, with, uh, with you, uh, Elad, tell us a little bit about what your organization does. Thank you, Peter. So SegaSec uh, is uh, specializing in protecting organizations from online fraud, phishing scams, brand impersonations, basically anything which is outside of the perimeter and targeting the customers and the supply chain of an organization. So anything which is out there. We're providing both uh, monitoring solutions to detect things before they're happening, and we're also addressing the attacks to make sure that users are actually not compromised. Um, I'm going to have a session about this tomorrow at 3.30, so I'll tell you more about this. That's great. Dirk, uh, after two people with a funny accent, I think you're the last uh, one with a funny accent before we get on Accents? to the... Uh... <laughs> at uh, DMARC Analyzer, I focus on DMARC reporting and policy enforcement. So we help our clients uh, to, to gain visibility in their email channels and to learn them which emails are being sent on, on behalf of their domains. This could be, on one hand, uh, the emails which are sent through authorized sources, such as Mimecast. But of course, there can be unauthorized and potentially malicious sources out there as well. And the DMARC data on our platform uh, provides visibility in exactly which emails are sent. And if our clients, have, uh, and together uh, with our support, uh, have ensured the alignment, the DMARC alignment of their authorized sources, basing up fixing, basically fixing the authentication, at that point, we can help them uh, to enforce the DMARC policy. And that way, they can truly take control of the messages which are being delivered on their behalf. So maybe uh, Dirk and I were taking a little bet earlier. By show of hands, who has got DMARC actively enforced on their uh, domains today? <laughs> OK. It's good to see. Oh, we do. <laughs> That's good. Um, it's, it's a complicated process, but this, who, would, who would think that that preventing somebody else sending email as your domain would require so much work. But DMARC's obviously the innovation that helps us, uh, or the standard that helps. Is this a new thing, Dirk? Uh, the DMARC publication uh, was, uh, or the DMARC standard was published in 2012. So it's not, not entirely new. But uh, 2012 is also the year in which we started. However, over the last years, we've, we've seen an enormous increase in the adoption. 2012. So welcome to the 90s. Um, is this something everybody should? should do, or is it just for certain types of companies? Most definitely. At least if you, can, if you care about your, your, about your brand, about at least the emails which are sent on your behalf and towards your clients and towards your, your employees. Uh, so yes, I would say that this applies to all of us. That's great. OK, uh, on to the easy to understand accents. Matt Polly from CrowdStrike. What do you guys do? Sure. If I don't. Um, so CrowdStrike's mission is we stop breaches. 
Uh, we do that across kind of three different categories. Number one, we provide professional services, um, both reactive and proactive. By that I mean incident response on the reactive side, compromise assessments, adversary emulation on the, on the proactive side. We then provide threat intelligence um, through a variety of different reporting capabilities. Um, and, and lastly, the thing that we mostly focus on is our CrowdStrike endpoint protection platform which is a software as a service product that provides an agent that runs on your endpoint, whether that's a laptop, desktop, server, cloud-based workload, that then reports data, streams, events, and, and information telemetry back to our cloud-based platform, which we then divide up into a variety of different products from endpoint detection and response, next generation antivirus, managed threat hunting, et cetera. We also then provide that data to third party products that can, that can actually deliver cybersecurity products on top of our platform that we're not going to address with our, our native um, R&D. That's great. Jen, Rapid7, tell us about what you guys do. Sure. So Rapid7 provides solutions and services that help teams find exposures in their environment and detect and respond to threats. So we provide uh, vulnerability management solutions in our Insight VM product, application security solutions, um, and a detection response platform uh, with our Insight IDR platform. Uh, we also provide orchestration automation to help teams be more efficient at doing all of that within their organizations. It's good. Now, your story is quite interesting. Uh, maybe share with us how you came to join Rapid7. Yeah, so I joined Rapid7 about two years ago with the acquisition of uh, my startup, Command, which is an orchestration automation company. Command. That's great. And that's the, uh, that's the uh, aspect of Rapid7 that we're integrated with today. Sure. Yeah, we took that technology and brought it to the Rapid7 platform so we could integrate with our solutions while still remaining an open platform to be able to integrate with other vendors that are out there. That's great. So Joe, obviously you work for Mimecast and you're product manager for the uh, API integration. Cyber Alliance program. You uh, have the t-shirt to prove it. And each one of these partners are, uh, firstly, they're all companies that Mimecast uses uh, in our uh, corporate IT stack. We use service, products or services from each one of these uh, companies. But, but it's less about that and it's much more about what's the benefit that we could collectively help our customers and our partners to achieve through integrations, right? That's right, that's right. So we started a couple of years back, we had a very small emerging program, and we started talking to customers, and we said, what can we do to better protect you? Largest attack surface comes through email, 90% of attacks. So the use cases we're hearing from our customers were bilateral threat exchange, help me remediate, help me orchestrate, help enrich my firewall, exchange threats. So that evolved into our formal program we have now. If you go out to a website, we have over 40 alliance partners and some really wonderful ones here on stage. That's great. So what I'd love to hear, because you all have different perspectives, you come from different countries, different parts of the industry, I'd love to hear from, from each of you, what are the trends that you're seeing? What's going on? What, what are your companies really thinking hard about? And then how does that play into your vision of the integration with Mimecast. Where do you see those synergies as well? Maybe Matt, you want to kick off. Uh, so, so number one trend we're seeing are um, cybersecurity attacks that are being perpetrated with a, a Tesla branded flamethrower. <laughs> so <laughs> we might, yeah, we, we probably need to talk to you. <laughs> and you guys sell firewalls? No. <laughs> um, actually, what we're seeing, um, you know, t two things is uh, uh, s sort of the, um, the complexity of the attacks. Uh, it, it's, it's across a couple of different vectors. Number one, state-sponsored, we track about 81, 82 different state, nation-state-sponsored adversaries. Um, they're really layering on different levels of complexity with their attacks. Um, you know, for example, uh, you know, last year, the Olympic attack, there were a number of false flags that were planted by the adversary we call Voodoo Bear. Um, that were meant to um, kind of lead people down kind of uh, false paths to identify or, or um, provide attribution to different adversaries than the ones that were actually perpetrating that attack. 
Um, and you know, th that complexity comes across also in the fact that some are being perpetrated through malware attacks that are then being followed up through living off the land, dumping credentials, all these different com complex layers of attack that are um, being brought to bear because they're so well sponsored from these nation states. Um, and there's so much at risk. I mean, the big game hunting that's coming across, the, the number of, of uh, entities that are attacking large enterprises and small enterprises looking for, uh, looking for ransom, or you know, trying to, to hold people for ransom. The other thing that we're seeing is uh, the e-crime the e syndicates that are coming together, putting together strategic alliances, and really focusing narrowly on their particular skill and expertise across the MITRE ATT&CK framework. So, uh, so Matt, if, if, uh, if the bad guys are teaming up, what's the vision in terms of, of our collaboration? No, it, it, it's a great point. So we've worked really closely with the MIMCAST team to put together uh, an integration that allows us to th share threat intelligence across the endpoint as well as the email security. And the way I like to think about this, is, you know, in terms of an analogy, is making sure that you've got different sentinels at different areas, different doors and windows of the castle walls, and we're sharing that information. Hey, we just saw a bad guy, they're trying to do this over here at this door, let's make sure they don't come back to that window or that other door. And so being able to pass that threat intelligence back and forth from email security to endpoint security really helps layer on the protection the same way that the bad guys are layering on those attacks. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. You spoke a lot about deception as you were talking about these different false flags and things like that. Elad, what are you seeing in the marvelous world of deception out there? Um, so for us, uh, we're hunting things out there in the wild, uh, again, outside of the perimeter. So we see the attackers are advancing their ways and basically dictating the pace, and we see them applying a lot of deceptive capabilities to evade companies like ours. So dynamic attacks, uh, changing IPs, uh, hiding uh, from bots that we operate. Um, at least for us, the game is also to, as they are trying to trick us or trick the, uh, the victims, we are also applying deceptive capabilities and are playing a game of let's change uh, the equation a bit, so. I'd, I'd like to come back to that, but, f but first, surely if they don't have DMARC implemented, they don't need to even worry with all of that. They can just pretend to be your domain. Is that right, Dirk? Are you? They can. Yeah, as you mentioned earlier, you know, <coughs> in, uh, in, in the keynotes, uh, but, uh, but if, you, if you look at the design of email, it's absolutely not secure. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't provide any protection against impersonation. Mm -hmm. And basically, only when you enforce the DMARC policy, you, you can prevent this, uh, at least with the scope of your own domains. This is also something we see, at least we, with DMARC, at least, well, uh, in order to enforce DMARC, you don't have to really focus on the bad stuff. So at least our, our job is particularly to, 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 to work on something good to prevent bad stuff from happening. At least once you have that enforced, and this is also what we have seen at, at a number of clients who basically protected uh, their domains with DMARC and uh, basically pre preventing impersonation, we see that behavior of these bad actors moving towards other, other domains. So you take the easy stuff out of the way. You take that off the table, and then you see the attackers moving more towards this deceptive type of Correct. approach. Correct. So then and, and what would an attack like that look like? So an attack like that can be that someone is registering a domain which looks very similar to yours, up to almost identical. And then what we're seeing a lot recently, are, and I'll show this tomorrow, are dynamic attacks which the, att the, the website that you're in front of is actually behaving like the original website, so you can even log in and see your account, see your balance, but you've actually just been tricked into giving away everything that you have to the attacker without even knowing that anything happened. Uh, and again, neither the victim nor the organization which is trying to handle it are aware that anything happened. That's pretty scary. Yep, definitely. Jen, what are you seeing out there, and, how, and what's the vision of the integration with yeah, so like Matt and some of the other people here, uh, I think we're also seeing uh, attackers becoming more sophisticated and using automation to actually achieve more uh, at scale. And I think it's, we as an industry have to realize that, hey, like it's not just good enough for us to be that sim that alerts on the, on the bad thing 
or us being the um, vulnerability management solution that shows you the exposure. For the customers and the people out there, they actually want to get to the point where they can effectively respond to the threats that we're telling them about and actually remediate the vulnerabilities we're telling them about. And that means working with other uh, processes and tools in their environment. Um, it's not just our tool that they use to actually achieve success in their VM programs or in their threat detection response programs. Um, so we want to work with vendors, and we have integrated with Mimecast to help us do, do these kinds of things and actually help security teams achieve their outcomes. So um, one of the examples is with our SIM product, we detect, whenever we detect uh, something that could be a spear phishing domain in your logs or other um, network activity, uh, we want to go ahead and integrate with your email gateway. We don't want to just tell the customer it's your job to go ahead and make sure you put the protections in place with the thing that we detected. We want to integrate with vendors like Mimecast to make sure that it just happens automatically and quickly so we can respond at the same speed that attackers respond. Yeah, to, uh, we see the exact same thing, and that, that speed to response is so critical. Our studies show that a variety of different attackers have different breakout times. We consider breakout time when they land on the network through that spear phishing attack or you know, through mimicking um, you know, your website and capturing your, your credentials and then entering the network through that, that, that method. The time it takes them to get from landing in your network to spread, spreading laterally throughout the network on average is about 18 minutes for the Russian adversaries. For the Chinese adversaries, it's a little bit longer at about an hour. That's because the first guys are Russian. Yeah. <laughs> so if you if you're not able to quickly respond, you might be you might you might find yourself in trouble. One ten sixty is our kind of methodology. A minute to detect, ten minutes to isolate, sixty minutes to remediate. And you need to do that through the integration of the various components and layers of defenses. That's really interesting and a little bit scary as well. Is there a way to attack the attackers. You know, we talk a lot about defense and being defensive. Let Matt talk about that. <laughs> no, I'll take a stab at that. Yeah. Uh, so this is definitely something that uh, we are doing. Uh, for example, if an attacker is aiming to collect credentials from users, we're saying, let's give them exactly what they want. So we're creating millions of fake data records and we've established a 20 million bot network across the world, which we're using to feed all this data, which look authentic to the attacker, and we achieve two things. One, we're diluting their data so they can't find the needle in the haystack, and also this data is marked, so when the attacker would come to use it, our customers or uh, people on the other line can identify it and either block them or actually lead them into a honeypot. So basically, we're setting up the trap and leading them into the trap. Interesting. Doesn't sound very nice. No, it's not. <laughs> not for them. That's good. Um, Matt, do you have any thoughts on this? <laughs> you guys are a public company now. You, I don't know if you're allowed to attack attackers. No, absolutely not. I mean, uh, despite what you may, may hear from um, you know, our, our president or, or whomever <laughs> else, um, CrowdStrike does not proactively attack. I think our best defense is, uh, or, or, or anyone's best defense starts with, with attribution, right? I mean, and that's as close as, as CrowdStrike's gonna get to attacking the attackers, mm -hmm. is actually fingering which bad guys are re responsible for what. Because if you're able to identify who is the attacker, you know a little bit about their motivation, what they're after, are they here to you know, cause havoc w within the environment, shut down the environment, collect ransomware, steal IP, just um, generally uh, you know, ha in, inflict damage on the reputation of the, the company or the entity. Um, so you know that motivation. You also know the, the different tools, techniques, and procedures that they utilize, mm. right? So you can better defend. Know the enemy, and, and you know how to, how to defend against it. Yeah, interesting. I know, Elad, some of the things that you guys do are, are takedowns of, of malicious sites or malicious environments. Um, yes, uh, so this is part of the, the, the reaction, so we're not just providing intelligence, but we'll also make sure that end users are not compromised, and takedown is part of that. Um, and as the attackers are becoming um, very advanced and automating the ways, uh, swift takedown and blocking of the attack is something which is really critical. And we're seeing a lot of organizations, it takes them at best days, but in many cases weeks and months, mm. um, and we take them in hours and sometimes minutes. 
Um, and this is imperative. Like digital Krav Maga. It's, uh, you know, uh, being uh, all, all of us, as one can expect, ex Mossad, so okay. we need to, to do that. <laughs> okay, we'll stand next to him at the bar tonight. Um, <clears throat> Joe, your sense of how all of this comes together and, and uh, customers really looking to try and build a, a coherent system that works together. Yeah, we talk to customers all the time, and the key thing is really understanding what their needs are. So we kind of break it down. There's a SIM category, and we have a core set of use cases there to get all the Mimecast logs available into a SIM tool, and then we attack that with a multiple set of SIMs. Then we do the same thing with orchestration vendors. And many firms actually have orchestration built in, like you have, Matt, in your tool set. Then we look at the other categories across the board. So it's looking for that whole core set of use cases we can solve. But what's also nice is the multiplier effect. So if you have the ability to utilize Segasec and you have a list of blocks domains, we can then share that information with CrowdStrike, with your firewall. So it's a many integration to Mimecast and we have the ability to share those policies and whatnot to other uh, providers as well. So what's live with the integration today with, with Segasec? Really cool one. You want to take that? You want me to yeah, grab it? Sure. So, either? Um, as we're hunting things out there in the wild, things that even before they become malicious, what, right when they're born uh, and we think that they're suspicious enough, uh, we have the integration based on the APIs that we're basically populating policies back into Minecraft to block sender domains or to block domains or URLs. Uh, and basically to impact both email and web security and before they actually hit the gateway. So we are basically uh, enriching um, the Minecraft platform and allowing it to be much more proactive and be ready for things to, to come in and, and block them immediately. And, and Joe, uh, when is this going to be live? Uh, T minus a month ago. Uh, right, it's in production <laughs> now, so all good. That's fantastic. <clears throat> That's great. Um, Jen, anything you want to add, any advice that you would give to, to Mimecast customers as they think about <laughs> sort of growing the maturity curve? You've, you've started a couple of companies, so you have a, an eye for trends and, and good, good uh, sort of where technology is going. Yeah, so again, for me, um, and it's kind of weird to say this as a security vendor, it's not just about tools and technology. It's about really understanding, um, first of all, your business and the risk. Uh, not every product is going to suit your needs. So understanding what's important to you, uh, like what, your, what the, your threat model is and what matters to your environment, um, and having the right people in place. Um, so you, it really is about all of those components and figuring out how you successfully, maybe with a small set of use cases, um, achieve success, right? It's not just about implementing a SIM and getting that working. It's about actually implementing detection and response effectively across your entire environment. Um, same thing with VM. It's not just about buying a VM solution and running some scans. It's about how you can take the output of these tools and actually operationalize them to reduce risk. Really interesting. <clears throat> Dirk, one for you. We've seen governments uh, mandating that, uh, in fact, in, in Europe as well as in the US, mandating that DMARC has got to be implemented. Is that a smart move from governments. Normally, they don't come up with great ideas for cybersecurity. Um, <laughs> Certainly not in Europe, they don't. Um, yeah, I think it is, obviously. Uh, of course, we, we, we uh, encourage the uses of DMARC uh, in, in general. But at least what we specifically see, and uh, of course, these are, I think, right now, Australia, uh, UK, uh, USA, Norway, and uh, the Netherlands. And in these, these countries, it's, it's mandatory for governmentals. Uh, to uh, use DMARC, uh, but what we also see is that other organizations uh, in these countries t t tend to adopt DMARC more and more, so I do say it's, uh, it's a smart move. Currently in EU, it's still best practice right now, uh, but it's, it's kind of, yeah, so for, of course we see at least organizations and, and governmentals copying each other, and in a way it makes sense, uh, let's say if 80% uh, uh, of, of the organizations in your area or in your country uh, has DMARC enforced, it, it becomes very attractive for attackers uh, to, to move towards these, uh, uh, these remaining 20%. Uh, so therefore, of course, this, this will stimulate the, the entire landscape to adopt DMARC more, which is a good thing. Does it that way as well? Uh, I, I think on a slightly different way, but even uh, having a, a DMARC policy enforced is, I think, uh, is right now with email the only way to exp ex explicitly instruct receivers out there, and so outside your network, network how to, to deal with specific messages which are sent from unauthorized sources. Mm. 
And in a way, this is also used by the Mimecast gateway, again, uh, supporting the ecosystem in order to help us make, make more clever decisions. Are you really passionate about the world moving towards DMARC because it starts to bring trust back into the email network, trust that's been eroded by cyber criminals and, and people performing scams and things like that. How much, how much adoption of DMARC do you need to see in the world? What percentage before you think you can die a happy man? <laughs> yeah, it's like a mission impossible. I would say, of course, every no man out there needs, needs a DMARC policy. It, it just, it, I do believe, and it's also the trend we see, it, it's becoming a best practice standard. Uh, so yeah, basically everything. It's around. That's great. I think, of course, the enforcement can be challenging, and especially for organizations with complex email architectures, yeah. who have endpoints in, uh, in different continents. Sometimes for these clients, uh, well, actually, the, the, the DMARC project can actually be a journey of discovery. So sometimes they learn about old, forgotten legacy systems uh, sitting in data centers, which are still sending emails. Um, so it, it's, of course, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting for these organizations to, to use it. Um, and of course, yeah, a, a broader adoption is it's just, it, it, it's the standard. It is How long does it take to get fully DMARC enforcement compliant? Um, it, it depends, of course, per project. Um, generally, we state to, so let's say, mid-sized enterprise organizations, uh, it's between uh, six up to 12 months. However, wow. we, we helped organizations to, 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 to realize this in six days. Six um, yeah, so it, 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 it really depends. So you, a DMARC analyzer has tools and technologies that really make it a lot less time consuming and less uncertain. It's our mission to, to simplify DMARC enforcement, so absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So obviously, uh, both Elad and Dirk's companies are, are smaller than CrowdStrike and, and Rapid7, and we have very close partnerships with them, in fact, um, to make it easier for our customers to be able to uh, buy these, what we call Zone 3 services for uh, DMARC in, uh, uh, getting DMARC best practice in place and, and getting the, uh, the Segasec services in place. You can actually buy those services from Mimecast as an add-on to your, your subscription. So that's something that's brand new. Um, and we really had a lot of demand, customers saying to us, we love these offerings. We'd, we'd love to be able to purchase those through Mimecast. So, uh, so that's available through both our, our reseller partners uh, as well. So um, we're, we're very excited about that. Um, I don't know if we, if we geared up for it, but we have a couple of minutes left. Um, and if we have anyone who's willing to yell loudly enough, uh, we can certainly take questions from, from the floor, too. Does anywhere, anyone out there behind these super bright lights uh, have a question for any of the, uh, any of the panelists? There we go. We have a microphone coming for you. Of DMARC. Um, I've also heard of, you know, we use we were looking at DKIM. How is that different or the same? Um, shortly. It's kind of a complex question. At least if you look at the uh, DMARC was actually built on top of SPF and DKIM. And so you had for a long time initially SPF, later on DKIM, uh, two existing uh, email authentication protocols. And DMARC actually is, 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 is more like a system or a check above that, which either uh, uh, validates via DKIM or SPF. And there's a kind of complex thing which, which is alignment, uh, alignment around that. And so at least the, the DKIM status or SPF status needs, needs to be, uh, let's, um, let's uh, state it easy, in, in a good shape, in line with DMARC. And then the DMARC check will pass. OK, so kind of both sides. Absolutely, yeah. And I think the, the thought behind uh, DMARC is at least to use, uh, so in, in theory, uh, if, if future authentication protocols were, were to be found, they could be uh, also uh, be part of DMARC. And the thought to use both of them, and either uh, at this point, uh, if you look at the DMARC specification, in order to reach alignment, only one of them should align. Uh, so, the, so they can, can be used as a fallback. And this was uh, also invented to, to, pre to prevent false positives. Thank you. Thank you. OK, perhaps more deeply technical questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
Is the audio working? Oh, okay. Uh, perhaps one thing uh, Elad mentioned is uh, Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. in Pegasus. There's, there's, a, there's a dedicated session as, uh, presented by me, uh, which, which I'll, in which I'll clarify this further. It is really interesting. I mean, this whole journey, SPF, it's actually gone back a very long way. I, I remember uh, when our company was just four people large, and SPF was trying to get its uh, feet off the ground. <clears throat> we built these Java SPF libraries, which we put into the open source community as our proud contribution to trying to move the needle forward. And we really started to try and study these different techniques. And then obviously, uh, Yahoo and others came in to, to drive uh, DKIM forward. Microsoft came along and tried to take over the whole lot and create a proprietary standard um, <laughs> for the world and lodged a bunch of pat patents, and so it got very political and very complex just trying to solve this issue of, of uh, authenticated senders. So we've tracked it for a long time, and, uh, and I think it's finally reaching a point of maturity where it really does, uh, it really is important for, for, for companies of all sizes to start paying attention to it, uh, and it's a mature, workable solution. Of course, it's not a silver bullet. Once you've done that, and you need to do that, you then need to start thinking and worrying about people pretending to be your domain in ways that isn't explicitly your domain. So really interesting stuff. Folks, I think we are finally out of time, but um, we've had a lot of fun up here. Uh, South African, Israeli, Dutchman, and three marvelous American folks. <laughs> um, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. All right. Thanks, panel. Let's have a nice hand for the panel. Christina, Peter, thank you so much for coming out today. Excellent. Good. I'm glad you were here, of all people. Uh, we have a uh, great morning for you tomorrow morning. Uh, Art Coviello will be here, and Janet Levesque are going to kick it off tomorrow morning. But at this time, we invite you to go down to the Resilience Hub that's on the exhibitor level. We have a reception down there and a lot of fun. How about a nice hand for all of our speakers today? See you tomorrow morning. Thanks, everybody. Thank